here with you all today. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to, honestly, um, it's kind of amazing reading a sermon by Martin Luther King Jr. because it's just, makes anybody sound like they can preach. Let's go to that one. Uh, it's amazing. Work. So um, let's, have, let's have a prayer before we uh, reflect on our scripture for today. Let's pray. God, let your presence be with us. Reveal your glory and help us to see it. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our lives, so that we can see and know and follow. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So all through Advent and uh, Christmas, the Christmas seasons, Jesus' mother Mary gets a lot of attention as someone who experiences up close and personal God's incarnation in human form. Mary is young but brave when the angel tells her the news about this new baby. She is joyful and breaks out into songs of praise when she tells her cousin Elizabeth about it. And when the time comes to have the baby, she goes with Joseph to Bethlehem. And then is the witness to these strange events, shepherds coming to the stable to tell her about spectacular angel sightings, and later scholar astronomers from the east telling her about an auspicious star rising at her son's birth. And in these moments, Mary watches and listens and ponders. But all these stories come from the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, which tend to overlap with each other in a way that neither overlaps with John. And when it comes to stories about where and when and how Jesus was born, John skips it and moves straight into theology with a little bit about the book of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, John begins, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that in the Gospel of John, Jesus' mother comes across very differently than she does in Matthew or Luke. For example, she's never actually named Mary. They never call her Mary um, in the Gospel. She's always just Jesus' mother, which is interesting. And in today's story, she's much less of a listener and an observer much less of a ponderer and a wonderer, and become somewhat equipped with inside knowledge that she is prepared to use. The occasion is a wedding, which in this case includes an open wine bar. The problem with an open bar, of course, is that it can get pretty expensive or run out of stock, which is what happens to this particular set of newlyweds. The reds and the whites are both down to the, the last couple bottles. There's a line forming, and there's no more two-buck chuck in the back. <laughs> Jesus says, it's all gone. We're going to drive to Virginia to get more. <laughs> there's a line forming. Jesus is catching up with an old friend, and then Mary sees this line forming. And she sees the nervous waitrons, and she taps Jesus on the air. And she gives him a look that says, I know that you know that I know that you can do something about this. Social disaster. Party foul. That's what it is. It's party foul that's about to befall this family in the middle of their celebration. It's, it's the worst party foul ever. <laughs> so her words are pretty simple, though. She says, they have no wine. This points it out. Jesus plays it cool. It's not my time yet, he says, doing the mystical Gospel of John thing where Jesus is always foreshadowing his death and resurrection. My hour has not yet come, woman. But the thing is, while his final hour has not yet come, in the last few days, Jesus has been out recruiting followers with big promises and small. And his mother knows, maybe just from knowing him, maybe from seeing what he's been doing the last couple days, um, that he is about to do something big, and it's time to get started. <coughs> she walks up to him, not knowing what to expect from her own son, but hoping and ready to take the chance and unleash this big thing on the world. What is it that makes this question necessary? Why doesn't Jesus decide for himself that it's time to change water into wine? Is there some part of him that needs someone else to recognize his potential? Or was he just nervous and had to have a little push? I don't understand this, but I wonder about it. But Mary seems pretty sure of herself. She ignores Jesus' protest about the time not being right. And she turns to the servants and she says, okay, he's going to handle it. Do what he says. 
<coughs> and the results, the first beautiful, spectacular, amazing sign is incredible and huge and abundant. I wonder if Mary really expected this response. I'm going to say probably not. There are six tall stone jars. And when I think about these, I'm imagining like those main vases, you know, like the ones that are always getting broken in movies, right? You know, like this big, you could plant a little palm tree in them or something. So each of them holds 20 or 30 gallons of water that people have to use for ritual hand washing, which is already kind of overkill, because how often do you need 20 or 30 gallons of water to wash your hands, right? Uh, but they're standing empty, so I guess that <coughs> tells us how often they get used, right? And Jesus has his servant, the servants fill them with water, which in the process of filling and being carried to the head steward, the wedding coordinator, if you will, turns into wine, really good wine. So we imagine like one box of wine. There might even be one out there I should have brought it in as a, a visual. It's about half a gallon. Is that right? I don't drink a lot of wine, but let's say half a gallon, right? So now imagine 300 boxes of wine, all right? That's, it's kind of preposterous. It's enough for a thousand people to have a good evening. And now that I think about it, the whole thing is kind of preposterous, right? What is God doing on earth? Walking around, going to weddings, giving people instructions, and in the meantime, carrying around and holding in this tremendous power that just has to be let go a little, revealed a little. No incantations, no sweat on Jesus' part. He doesn't need like the Harry Potter wand, right? And the water becomes wine. Anxiety becomes joy. Lack becomes abundance. It's a little ridiculous. But that's our story, and we're sticking to it. <laughs> God so loved the world that he extravagantly, wantonly, with abandon, gave his only begotten son so that we could have life and have it abundantly. So what's our takeaway? What does this story mean for us today? I keep coming back to Mary, who saw Jesus and knew he had power, and she asked him to use it. There's something in there about prayer or about trusting God, about faith. There's a story I've read about a bunch of theologians who are sitting around and having a conversation about one of Jesus' other miracles, but it's a very similar one, where Jesus feeds 5,000 people with just a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread, depending on which version of the story you read. And one theologian says, well, maybe Jesus encouraged people to bring out their food, right? It's kind of like, a, oh, well, if that food is out, then I'll bring out my food. And someone else has another theory. And the third person says, well, what if we look at the historical context of the community that wrote this story down, right? And so the discussion starts heating up. Uh, but there's one guy, he's just sitting there, he's pretty quiet, he looks very thoughtful. And finally, one of his colleagues says, okay, well, what's your theory? Where does this miracle come from? And Joe says, well, I don't know about everything you've been talking about. But I was thinking that if Jesus can feed all those people, then maybe he can feed me too. So today I invite you, with Jesus' mother, to be on the lookout for him and to ask him to bring his power. When the disciples realize what has happened, it's a little like suddenly finding out someone you always knew has a hidden talent or is a celebrity or is tremendously wealthy, except times a million, because he's God. So when Jesus reveals his glory in this transformation, his disciples realize that they are in the presence of God, and they trust him with their whole lives, and they follow him. May we do the same. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's have